right, I want to present some thoughts on how God deals with the nations. Um, it's something that we don't think of very much nowadays. But back in Old Testament times, it was very much uh, God dealing with the nations, Israel being his chosen people, uh, and the nation of Israel, his chosen nation. Uh, the rest of the world, uh, just uh, nationalists of their own order and their own doing. So uh, we want to see how God deals with the nations. The first scripture I'd like you to look at is in Psalm 103. Now in Psalm 103, he's, he's telling us that, uh, that God is over the nations, that uh, he is the sovereign Lord of all the nations, uh, as he's the sovereign Lord of all nature, uh, of the world, of uh, nature and of uh, humans. Uh, he's the sovereign Lord of all, both now here on this earth and in the heavenly realm as well. In verse 19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens. His sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his host, who serve him, doing his will. Bless the Lord, all you works of his, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, he says, O my soul. God's throne is established in heaven. God's sovereignty, his absolute power, his absolute rule is over all things. Even in the heavens, as you can see, the angels obey his will. When God gives a command in heaven, nobody questions it. At least not among the righteous angels. They just want to hear what God wants them to do and their whole being is given to carrying out God's will just as he commanded it. It's a great lesson for us. That's the objective as Christians that we try to do what they're doing. Hear God's word and carry it out to the best of our ability that God might be glorified and that we all might be blessed. In Psalm 47, he talks about this sovereignty in uh, a slightly different way, but nevertheless, it's uh, describing exactly the same thing. Psalm 47. <coughs> it says in verse 2, The Lord Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdues peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chooses our inheritance for us, the glory of Jacob, whom he loves. God has ascended with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a skillful psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people have assembled themselves as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. So we're getting a picture here of the immensity of God's authority and power over everything. He is the absolute ruler. He is the sole ruler of all things. But we have to learn something about the God who is the sovereign ruler of all things. And that is that he is a righteous God. A very important lesson for us all. Let's turn to Psalm 11. It says in verse 7, the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. God loves righteousness. He is righteous himself. That's part of his characteristic. He is righteous. Now, 
just a little explanation of what righteous is. Righteous is, in the Old, in the Old Testament anyhow, righteousness and justice <coughs> are used interchangeably. Now justice, we all know what justice is. It, it's it's uh, conforming to the law and uh, the law hopefully is just in the sense that it, the demands of the law are just right and are good and are for the benefit of everybody. They are morally correct. They are for the upbuilding and protection of all. So God is, is righteous. Now, righteousness and justice, there is a, a justice. For example, um, and I'm just trying to show you now where I see a slight difference between righteousness, not a difference, but an extension in righteousness that is not there in justice. In justice, when, when we had Abraham uh, and, uh, being visited by the three angels, one of them being Yahweh, um, Yahweh says, Abraham's my friend, am I going to withhold from him what I'm going to do? And he tells him that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah were so sinful that it was just for God to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But Abraham was able to appeal to God and he says, Will not the Lord of all the earth do right or deal justly as it says in the New American Standard? This is Genesis chapter 18. And what he's saying is, as a man, Abraham understood righteousness so well, uh, he understood that, yet yeah, justice demands that you destroy these people completely and utterly. But righteousness, which goes beyond justice, also has a pull on you, Lord, because you are righteous. And because you're righteous, will you not do the right thing here? And then Abraham says, starts with a, a high figure of uh, how many righteous, if, we fa if I found so many righteous in these cities, would you destroy the cities? And the Lord says, no, I won't destroy the cities. Well, poor Abraham has to whittle it down to 10 righteous men in the cities. And the Lord says, if you find ten righteous men, I'll spare the cities. Now that's what righteousness is. It's beyond justice. It has to do with, uh, with uh, rowing back from the, the absolute demand of justice and taking into consideration the difficulties that uh, people have, the, the, um, the uh, how would I say, the problems that, they, that we live in because of this broken world of ours and sinful world of ours. And he rose back on that absolute justice and allows for 10 righteous. If 10 righteous were found, he would have spared the cities. So righteous then, righteousness has to do with um, being just, being fair, being upright. That's what it has to do with. And God is all of those things. So in his consideration of us, he will think righteously. Now that's important. Not just, ju I want justice. I, don't, I want righteousness more than I want justice because I want God to be merciful to me and to be forgiving towards me. Right, so here we've got, a, here we've got a, a situation where the God, the sovereign Lord of all the earth is righteous. He's just and righteous. And because of that, he will take into consideration what in the overall is fair and right, given all the circumstances that are involved in the situations that he's dealing with. But that is exactly what he will do. Now, um, James uh, read from uh, Romans this morning about, uh, was it Romans 1 verse 18, where uh, it talked about God and how God is dealing with the whole of humanity. Uh, let's have a look there. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. God is looking to the nations 
to be righteous. He's looking to the nations to be righteous. He wants to find righteousness there. And what does he find? Unrighteousness. If righteousness is living to the standard of God's law, and incidentally, God is bound to his own law. Actually, it goes even much higher in God. God's perfection, his holiness, his holy perfection, which means in every characteristic, he is absolutely perfect. And in the interaction of all the characteristics that God has, there is a perfect harmony. And by that standard of measure, God measures everything that he does, whether it's in condemnation or in salvation. He's measuring everything by that standard of measure. Now, the law that was given by Moses is a reflection of that righteousness or that perfect standard. And the law that is given to us through Jesus Christ is a higher law with a more um, appropriate standard of righteousness in it. The law of love governs us and the law of love is much more stringent and much more difficult than just thou shalt or thou shalt not. Because it means we have to be involved in making judgments, righteous judgments like God himself as to how we should treat or the people as to what is right in the circumstances as to whether condemnation or approval needs to be given. We've got to make those decisions. But it, it just shows you how all of this is tied in. He finds unrighteousness here. And, and it's important for us to see that. Uh, uh, it, it's, uh, let's see, Isaiah chapter 24 is what I'm looking for now. He says in verse 4 there, The earth mourns and withers, the world fades and withers, the exalted of the people of the earth fade away. The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they transgress laws, violate statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore a curse devours the earth, and those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are born and few men are left. Just jump down to verse 19. The earth is broken asunder. The earth is split through. The earth is shaken violently. The earth reels to and fro like a drunkard and it totters like a, a shack. For its transgression is heavy upon it. It will fall, never to rise again. So it will happen in that day that the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings on the earth. So here's God looking for righteousness. And what he finds is unrighteousness. And God's reaction to this unrighteousness is to bring to bear his wrath on the people of unrighteousness, whether it be a nation or individuals. The reason why he brings punishment into this world is to teach the people that God wants righteousness. He doesn't want war. He doesn't want exploitation. He doesn't want people in competition with each other to destroy each other so that one can be dominant and the, uh, and the rest can be trodden underfoot by those who are more powerful. Righteousness doesn't behave in that way. But that's the standard we have set. Unloving, selfish, self-indulgent people who are all surviving at the expense of everybody else. 
But the punishments will come. Sin brings its own punishment. It's sort of built into it. If we're doing wrong, we'll suffer the consequences of that wrongdoing. And God has made it that way. It's just naturally that way. Because it's against what God is. It's against his law and his authority. It's a transgression of everything that is good and that is upright and that is holy and just and fair and moral. And we expect to be able to live in this way constantly in a downward spiral of wickedness and unrighteousness and think that as a nation we can get away with this and that God is, will turn a blind eye. God will do nothing about it. It's not true, brethren. It never has been true, nor is it true now. Just because we're going through a quiet patch, a prosperous patch, doesn't mean that God is not angry. It just means he's patient. That's all. We need to understand that. It's very important for us. To know. We, can, we can see it in what we're studying in the book of Exodus, can't we? Um, here now, God has to deal with a nation that is just as was described there in, uh, in Isaiah 24. Uh, inhabitants transgressing laws, violating statutes and breaking the everlasting covenant. This was, this was just the norm in Egypt. They had fallen into idolatry. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. That was the situation that they were in. Now God comes to work among these people and he sends Moses to Pharaoh as we know uh, and uh, the, the, the first time Pharaoh just tells him, look I don't know God. I don't know your Yahweh, your God. He's not in my pantheon of gods. He's not, uh, I'm not subject to him. Uh, and I'm not going to let the people go. <coughs> but he wasn't just holding the people, holding on to the people. He had, he had as, as we know, our former Pharaoh had decided that he would try and kill off the uh, Jewish nation in Egypt by having the firstborn of every family or having yeah, the firstborn of every family, or, or uh, the male babies of every family, I should say, are uh, thrown into the Nile and drowned. He tried to get the midwives, the Jewish midwives, to cooperate. That seems to me like he was trying to hide it from everybody else, and if he could get away with that, then he would have done the job without the rest of the nation knowing what was going on. But they wouldn't do it. They didn't do it. They refused to obey him, and rightly so too. But then he, he sends out a proclamation to uh, all the Jewish families that when they have a child, a male child, they have to drown it in the Nile. All the Egyptians would have known about it, so everybody would be looking out to hear when the child was born, to find out if it was a male child, to see if they did what the edict of Pharaoh demanded, maybe then to report them. You can imagine the, the chaos that was going on there at that time. But anyway, Moses was born at that time and he was saved. And uh, we know the story about how he got into Pharaoh's palace and was brought up as a prince in, in the palace. Now, after many years, in Midian, he's sent back and he meets Pharaoh and um, Pharaoh just increases the, 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 the toil and the labor and makes it more difficult for them to do the job that they've been given to do and increases the punishment because they're not willing to do it. Um, so when Moses came, comes to them again and says to them, the Lord's going to deliver you they, they just didn't listen to it. They couldn't believe it. It was just too much for them. They were so pressured by, uh, by Pharaoh and uh, so discouraged by the whole situation that they just wouldn't believe him. Moses has been sent back to Pharaoh. We were t talking the other night and he was discouraged. Um, and he had to go back into Pharaoh and talk to him 
uh, about what God wants. Um, so the competition was on. Pharaoh wasn't going to give in to the demands. The demand was simple. Let the people go three day journey into the wilderness and let them worship God. Uh, it, it's interesting that uh, in the early stages, we don't get an explanation as to why that would, would have been. But it says in chapter 8, 25, um, Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said, It is not right to do so, for we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God what is an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice what is an abomination to the Egyptians before their eyes, will they not then stone us? We must go a three-day journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he has commanded us. A reasonable request which Pharaoh absolutely refused. And so the plague start. And of course the, the first plague is that the Nile, which they worshipped as a god, <coughs> the waters of the Nile were turned into blood. The whole situation lasted about seven days. Can you imagine the consternation? They had nothing to drink. Um, it seemed like as it filtered down through the soil, the blood separated from the water again and they were able to dig down and find some water. But it would have been uh, subsistence amounts. So, uh, but the, the, whole, the whole thing, even the, the vision of it, just sickening. But I wonder, what, what came to me was, uh, here's, here's the blood of all these innocent children coming to the surface, so to speak. This is just figuratively speaking, of course, not actually. But coming to the surface, and now the death that had been inflicted on those children was going to now be inflicted on Egypt. Um, God is very righteous, even in his judgments, for that matter. Then after that, they had the frogs. The Egyptians were used to having frogs at certain seasons in the year, but nothing like the frogs that they had in the plague. Everywhere. They got into everything. Can you imagine these things? They're in your pots when you go to boil the kettle or make some food. They're in your bed when you turn the sheets over. They're in your cupboards where your clothes are hanging. They're, they're everywhere. They're getting, in, they're getting under your skin. It would drive you mad. You stamp on them. You squash all that squishy, squashy stuff all over your place. And it starts to smell after a while. Can you imagine the situation that they were in? But Pharaoh hardened his heart. No way was he going to let them go. Then there was swarms of gnats. It was as if the dust of the earth became gnats or small little uh, midgy things. But it, it rose up like uh, a dense fog all over Egypt. Now you have these things. I, I, I walk down by the daughter in the summertime and you have these little midges. Uh, they, they, they come in groups and they usually, I don't know why, they, they usually congregate over the pathway where you're walking. And you're walking just nicely and then you're hit with this thing. They're in your mouth, in your eyes. You're spitting out. You're trying to avoid, get out of the way of these things. And, and that's what I imagine it was like then. You couldn't go anywhere. There was, the torment of it all was, was shocking. After that, they had flies. Now, uh, this seems to have been swarms of insects. But among them would be flies, and there, there's flies, there's horse flies. I remember with Ben when he was building his house, we were out on a summer's day and we were trying to get the, pour the concrete for the, the driveway up. And there was these horse flies, just, you, you, you had a t-shirt on, but they'd get on you and they'd bite you, and it was nasty, and you're scratching yourself. And uh, So you can imagine, um, those who come from Africa know what insects are like. The, these ones that irritate you and uh, they come into place at night and they're flying at the light or, uh, and they're bumping into you as well and uh, you're trying to kill them. Big, crawly, creepy things uh, flying around. It's horrible. So they had that experience, but he hardened his heart. There, a disease, a plague came on the livestock. Uh, and then after that, boils and sores on man and animals. You think your little cold sore is a nuisance? You have boils and sores all over your body like Job. 
and then you'll know what a plague of uh, boils and sores are like. But he hardened his heart again. Then you had the hail which came, a hail storm that had never been in Egypt uh, and would never be again. And it killed the animals that were out or left out in the fields. At that stage, he started to relent. He started to say, uh, the Lord is righteous, I'm wicked. But he didn't let them go. After that, there was the locusts who ate just up everything, everything. And he, he weakened them, but he dealt treacherously with Moses. He didn't have a heart to do what was right. He didn't have the heart to obey God. And then the death of the firstborn, which broke his spirit altogether, he let them go. Now, why, why, why would God do this sort of thing to a whole nation? Because he wanted them to learn righteousness. That's what he wanted them to do. He, he, this wasn't just um, vindictiveness on his part or a desire for revenge because of the bad treatment that they'd given his people, which they had done. This was to get them to come to their senses and to realize that there is a living God in heaven and he's the God in Egypt, whether uh, the Egyptians believed in him or not, and that he is the sovereign Lord of that nation, whether they believed that or not, that he had the power over nature to make them live or to cause them to die, and that uh, he was the one who should be listened to and he was the one who should be obeyed. But uh, let's see here if I can find what I'm looking for. Um, oh yeah, Isaiah 26, I think is what I'm looking for. He says uh, in verse 9, At night my soul longs for you. Indeed, my spirit within me seeks, for, seeks, your, di seeks you diligently. For when the earth experiences your judgments, the inhabitants of the earth learn righteousness. Though the wicked is shown favour, he does not learn righteousness. He deals unjustly in the land of uprightness and does not perceive the majesty of the Lord. So generally speaking, some of the Egyptians did learn. By the time the hail came, the warning was enough. They brought their animals, their livestock in to the shelter and they saved their animals because they believed God's word and they were protected from the hailstorm. So it's possible, and the fact that Pharaoh began to see that he was a sinner and that God was righteous was a, a, go, a move in the right direction. This is the way it should be. You learn righteousness, but they, the wicked only learn it temporarily. Like Pharaoh, they turn back to their ways and start doing all the things which had caused the problems in the first place. And what causes it is, I'm going to live my way. I don't care what God says. I don't care what God uh, has commanded me. I'm going to do it contrary to his command because it suits me. It is the right thing for me to do. It is the better thing for my life. And at the end, it's got what's going to make me happy. They learn nothing. We just learn nothing. Unfortunately, we learn nothing. But God is a righteous God. He didn't want to destroy the Egyptians. He was giving them every chance to repent. In Jeremiah chapter 18, he uses the, the uh, situation of the potter and the clay to teach Israel a lesson. But it's a lesson about not, how, not only how God deals with Israel, but how God deals with all nations. Verse 6, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does, declares the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, 
O house of Israel. At one moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down or to destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring on it. Or at another moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or to plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the God with which I had promised to bless it. Their reaction to it was when um, Jeremiah was telling them to turn back each of you from your evil ways. Verse 12, but they will say it's hopeless for we are going to follow our own plans and each of us will act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. That's their reaction to it. Quite often that's our reaction to it. But certainly that's the reaction of the nations. If the Lord brings disasters on the nations, oh well, we'll, we'll rebuild, we'll be stronger and better, we'll do what we, we have to do to make it right. What they mean by making it right is get it back to the way we had it and the way we wanted, not the way God wants it. Not the way God wants it. Do you think it was... Remember Nineveh, Jonah and Nineveh. Jonah went into Nineveh and he started preaching, within 40 days this place will be destroyed if you don't repent. They believed in the Lord, they believed in his word, and they repented. They repented with sackcloth and ashes on them. Even the king stepped down from the throne, took off his royal robes, and clothed himself in sackcloth and ashes. He told Put it on the animals as well. Perchance that the Lord will forgive our sins and be merciful to us. So it's even possible for, for a city as wicked as Nineveh was to repent. And God relented as he had promised in Jeremiah chapter 18 of the disaster that he was going to bring on the place. And when Jonah heard that he relented, he was disgusted. He couldn't believe, he could believe it. He says, that's why I didn't want to go in the first place. I knew you were slow to anger and compassionate and forgiving. That's why he didn't go in the first place. His natural, uh, nationalistic streak made him want God to destroy these mad hooligans of pagans who... Uh, who, who had done so much destruction around the world and he just wanted rid of them. But God's not like us. He's righteous. If they were willing to repent, he was willing to relent. A huge lesson for us. Somebody brings to your attention you're doing something wrong. Not according to the Bible. And you see plainly when you read that that's not according to the Bible. What, what we have to do is we have to fit the word of God, not the word of God fit us. That's important for us. All of us. But it's important for it to save your life. That's why you must build into your own life uh, on an individual basis. Build into your own life a willingness to see yourself as you really are, warts and all, to admit what you've done wrong or what you're doing wrong or what you need to change. But that's not enough. You have to take that last step and change the situation and change your thinking, change your ways. That's what has to happen. Then the Lord can accept you as being righteous but until then, you continue to be unrighteous and rebellious towards God. That's the situation. Now, we're told in um, Proverbs uh, chapter 14, verse 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a shame to any people. 
that's what God wants us to learn. As Christians, we have got to learn to be righteous. In other words, to do the right thing by God, because he deserves consideration, and his position, and his power, and his authority deserves consideration and submission. And we need to deal with our fellow man righteously. All this taking advantage of each other is wrong. We need to speak the truth with each other. We need to look for uh, what is right for their lives as well as for ours. And we need to judge them righteously. And we need to, if they've sinned, be willing to forgive if they relent. Or if they repent, we will relent. And that's what God does and that's what we should do. We should be ever open to that because that's what righteousness is all about. Now, unfortunately for the Egyptians, Pharaoh, even after letting them go, hardened his heart again and followed them. And he ended up in the Red Sea. His life was taken, as was the life of his army. And Egypt was on its knees. And that's what will happen. That's what will happen. That's why we need to be concerned about righteousness in our own society. It's not a small thing that people are doing wrong or going contrary to God's will. Whether it's in marriage, in divorce, whether it's in abortion, whether it's in making laws that are unfair or unrighteous, we need to be concerned because God's concerned and God's taking that to heart and God will act with wrath and unfortunately we will have to suffer the consequences of what those people want to do. We'll suffer. We're trying to prevent suffering just as God is trying to prevent suffering. In truth, the kingdom of heaven is a kingdom of righteousness. The new heaven and the new earth will be a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. When we are righteous, we're preparing ourselves for that kingdom. And we will be happy to be in that kingdom. But if we're going another road, we would never be happy in heaven. That's what the evil people don't understand. Oh God, he, yeah, he, he was a drunkard and a, and a gambler and he beat his wife and his, and his ch children left him and everything. But uh, this is his funeral. He was, uh, was alright. He was a nice fella. I drank with him all the time. He's a nice fella. As if that's the way God is going to think about it. Too much rubbish being spoken of in, in this regard. What did, what did God think when he was doing all these wrong things? Will God just forget it? Say it doesn't matter? Or will he hold him to account? I think the message is clear. There's other things now to be said on this whole subject. I haven't got the time to do it. This is, is sufficient for the moment. We can see God is the sovereign Lord. He's a righteous God. He deals with the nations as fairly as he deals with us as people. Uh, nations have to realize they are accountable to God and that what God wants for the nation is righteousness, not economic prosperity necessarily, not uh, uh, liberal laws, not uh, other things that are important to the, the people. What he wants is to see the people dealing with God righteously and dealing with each other righteously. That involves not taking advantage of the disadvantage. That involves sacrificing for what is right. Okay, I think that's about it. I hope that will help you and I hope it will give you a little bit more insight into how God deals with the nations. We'll talk some more about this again and we'll see it in other 
uh, ways how he dealed with, dealt with Babylonian uh, Babylon and uh, the Ninevites and so forth. And hopefully that'll uh, fill out the understanding that we're going to have of these.